propone el debate en el Salvador de Ordán es un comité de tocar en el comité a Marbocia y se hace un punto de vista a través de la plenaria de speaker y circuita el doctor Tomás Moore ya está leído la información sobre la biografía y la biografía de la biografía de la biografía de la biografía de la biografía Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, to present uh, our company indoors and uh, what we have been doing recently, like our progression from what we thought was a really easy thing to do, indoors localization, it doesn't sound so hard, uh, and uh, what we are doing now. So, uh, let's see here. Is this thing? Oh, wow, cool. So I will say something about what indoors is. The dot is not pronounced, so many people asked about this company in Serbia called Indo, but it is called Indoors. Uh, I'll say something about what we do and uh, who buys from us, and I will say something about how we do this, and then I will say something about uh, what we think is the most important development, at least from my, our side of view, and that is uh, stealing user data for benefit. Yeah? <coughs> which I think is a major topic in industry right now. Uh, big data is really uh, uh, important and it really changes the game. Uh, so for us, uh, this has been hugely important. So uh, this is the marketing slide. Uh, okay, uh, so who am I? I uh, I'm a doctor of particle physics. So I uh, grew up working with uh, tracking very small things and now I track humans instead. It's pretty much the same maths. It's carbon filters. Uh, you know, electrons and humans are not so different when you think about it. Uh, since around 2013, 2012, I started in indoors leading the research effort. I'm now the chief research officer of the company. I am a Swede, but I live in Austria, so I, I like speaking Swedish or German, or Austrian at least. Yeah. Uh, um, our company was uh, started around 2010 as a small tech startup. We got some venture capital and also plenty of research funding. We're around 20 people now, and of these around five people, depending on how you uh, count, is research. Uh, research is really driving the aims for the company. I mean, we're trying to expand and make a scalable system that hopefully can be included in some bigger system later on, right? So. Uh, we're based in Vienna, uh, in Austria, uh, and that's all I will say about this. So what we, what we basically provide for people is indoor navigation, uh, proximity, which is a weak form of navigation, uh, and uh, some analytics as well. And uh, the proximity system uh, just looks at beacons uh, and gives you an event uh, when you see this beacon. Uh, this gives you a very rough position, however it works uh, with very little battery consumption in the background. So for s when you don't need navigation features, it's uh, pretty useful. And uh, from an algorithmic point of view, it gives us data even when people are not using the phone, which is uh, very interesting for us. Navigation is uh, really real-time, on-the-phone, interactive map showing your location and what is around you. Uh, analytics uh, goes from very simple things like a heat map of where people were to more uh, intricate things. And I will say quite little about analytics today, but uh, that's personally the most interesting topic for me. So, uh, so what, we, what we really do, what we really rely on is uh, iBeacons or Eddystones or any Bluetooth thing or Wi-Fi uh, access points. And in our experience, the beacons is really a fantastic technology. They're extremely cheap. So you can put them up for a few dollars and uh, you can put quite many of them up. 
Wi-Fi infrastructures typically are deployed to give you one Wi-Fi of good quality in every place, which is not enough to give good indoors positioning, as very many of you probably have experienced uh, themselves. So we like beacons a lot. Uh, we use them a lot. Uh, our system works offline. That means we don't need to have a, a, any data connection, because uh, when we try that, uh, it turns out that the people expect it to just work on their phone, regardless of they are connected to the internet or not. And the indoors is actually a problem to have a consistent connection. Um, the, be uh, the beacons uh, can also be offline. They don't have to be connected to anything. They just say hello, hello, hello. Uh, so the stupider the technology, uh, the easier it is to use. So we like that. And they can be battery operated. Uh, you also need a floor plan to get started. Once you have set up an infrastructure, uh, we run on uh, off-the-shelf commodity start, uh, smartphones and tablets on both iOS and Android. Uh, our system is, is really a third-party SDK, so we prefer our customers to make their own apps with their own maps, and then we give them the location. But we actually do the whole package as well. But, uh, Quite often, uh, people don't want to make the whole app. Uh, we made an open source viewer demo program so people can quickly get started making their own app. And uh, we also have a dedicated measurement app uh, to, to uh, get the data uh, to start mapping. And then we, of course, have a cloud service where we store all the data uh, so for the phones to download and uh, to upload to, uh, where we run our analytic engines and computation engines. Uh, where basically all the work I do is in there. Uh, and then we have web tools so you can access your data and change things and uh, uh, interactively explore what is going on. And uh, you can use uh, indoors uh, technology in very many different uh, vertical businesses, right? Uh, from uh, uh, travel and retail and entertainment and many others. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what we see now is that many more people are aware that this is possible to do. So this part of education of the uh, customers is, is quite effective and people are understanding that this is possible right now. And they're also seeing that, uh, getting an idea of how good this has to be to work for, for, for their uh, cases. Uh, we have actually deployed quite many successful projects already uh, from very simple uh, proximity notifications. If you go into a store, it says welcome to the store, uh, to full navigation uh, solutions in large multi-story buildings. Uh, so we have customers in Europe and in the US uh, in a large variety of things. And I will just give you a few interesting examples. Uh, if you want to know more, you can ask me later. So, one is High Point Market. This is a trade show for furniture, which is super exciting, of course. Uh, and it's actually 11 floors, 32,000 square meters. They put almost 1,000 beacons up. 75,000 people used it, and they had to use it because the app was the registration and everything. And they have uh, routing through all these points. And it also has an indoor-outdoor interface. So, it's a, it's a pretty nice use case because the show is different every time they run it. So, so people will get lost. Uh, so, so there you really need indoors navigation. Uh, uh, MUMOC is the Museum of Modern Arts in Vienna. And we made a, a smart app for, for uh, exhibition tour guides. So you can see what the painting is in front of you, and it will explain to you why you're looking at the painting, in case you didn't know. Uh, and this is made modular, so you can change the pictures and stuff, uh, and the locations around. Uh, and it's integrated with the audio guide thing. And we've done a couple of other museums, and uh, this is really one market where indoors can bring you more engagement with the venue. Uh, so we really, uh, we really enjoy doing this. Uh, we wish there were more museums, of course, but, uh, but it's, uh, this is a really nice uh, showcase. San Francisco Airport is completely different. So there we did a system for, for uh, blind people uh, that actually uses uh, iOS accessibility features, and it just tells you what is around you. 
so you get situational awareness. Uh, and it, it can do things like saying, uh, did you know there's a Starbucks uh, 50 meters to your left? Uh, I mean, if you can get Starbucks to pay you for that. Uh, right now, it's, it's mainly a, a showcase for the Lighthouse of the Blind that we're working with for this. And, uh, but it's, it's growing to the entire airport, and it's a, this is going to be a really nice system. And uh, our blind users who tested this are really mind blown how, how nice it is. Uh, and uh, I am really fascinated that uh, you can make a really working smartphone app for blind people. It doesn't even have, I mean, the iPhones doesn't even have buttons, but they use it really well. So uh, it was pretty cool, I think. Uh, so how do, we, how do we do indoors localization? I guess most people are more interested in this than uh, who we sell it to. Uh, at least I am. So we have some requirements. We have, uh, it has to run on your normal phone. And the reason for this is that people are used to have high quality GPS when they're outside. It shouldn't be any harder to get location inside. It actually is, because we usually rely on dedicated apps, but it has to be as easy as possible. You want to use your own phone. You don't want to use a special phone or anything. Uh, and this gives us some restrictions. We basically have to rely on what is in the phones which is motion and environment sensors and the radios. Uh, to make this run in real time reliably, it has to be able to run offline. So all the algorithm has to run on the device. Uh, and uh, we, can't also, we can't also rely on uh, localizations on the infrastructure because of the same connectivity issues. Then it's just not fast enough for us. So really what we aim for is humans. So, so it's uh, indoor localizations for humans. That means you need to have around the size of a human in accuracy. And uh, because humans walk about one, two seconds, uh, uh, meters per second, then uh, you also need to have a latency that is consistent with that. And uh, if you try to work with Wi-Fi with smartphones, you know that usually you have a five, 10 second latency built in just because of that. Uh, to compensate for this, uh, you can use uh, smart tricks and especially the motion sensors that are um, much faster. With Bluetooth, this is a slightly smaller problem because Bluetooth scans happen faster just by, by design. Uh, but that also has some problems, of course. So, so really, uh, I think our goal is it should work for you and your phone in your environment. So it doesn't have to be super, super ultra accurate. We don't talk about centimeter accuracy here at all. Uh, but it can't, it can't show you the wrong room. Then the whole point of navigation goes away, right? Uh, you also need a map. So this is our map drawing tool. Uh, you need a map. And uh, this turns out to also be quite difficult. I mean, when you get contacted by a customer and they say, we want indoors localization in our venue, uh, can you do that? And then uh, they don't even have a decent map. Often we get a picture of the escape route taken with a smartphone camera and have to work with that. So you have to make really easy mapping tools. And any algorithms that uses a lot of information about the building, if you want to do modeling, you want to see okay, signal damping in, in uh, plaster walls and so on, it is really hard to do unless you have really good maps. So getting good maps and the standard for good maps is something we're really interested in. Uh, this is uh, a picture of our indoors localization engine. Uh, basically, the first and most important thing we do is uh, we collect the data from the smartphones. And we put this data in buffers that conditions the data in various ways. So it turns out that these uh, sneaky guys who create the phones and the operation systems, they do a lot of tricks. So, so wh when they are busy, they will send the same value many times. Uh, and uh, they, they will also smooth data in bad ways and so on. So phones are not research grade equipment. And we deal with that in our, uh, in our what we call buffers. It's, it starts as a simple queue, but it then has a bunch of conditioning operations. Then we have a, a radio localization system that will give us just a blue dot. It will give us an approximate blue dot. Uh, and uh, from the sensor data, we do pedestrian dead reckoning, or actually we do step detection. We detect the step events, 
the, the direction of the steps, and then we fuse it together in an adaptive Kalman filter. And this fusing together in the filter, you can talk to Boshian, who will present a poster about this, uh, if he can find a printer. <laughs> uh, it's a key feature to do this filtering in a way that can deal with uh, the delay from radio uh, to sync this properly, to, to give accurate locations. The other feature that we really need to know to make the Kalman filter good is to have good error estimates in these parts. And this is much, much harder to implement in a reasonable way than to actually just implement the algorithms. Once we have the fused trajectory, we upload it to indoors for analytics. Uh, and uh, we download a radio map for the radio localizations also from the cloud. <coughs> so the basics of our system is radio fingerprinting that everyone who went to the tutorial is now an expert on. It's super easy. You have a floor plan. You have a radio map, these dots with point measurements. Uh, you take your phone, you look at the phone, okay, which, which uh, access points can I see? Maybe I see these three. And then you select the points that are most similar. Uh, so maybe it selects these four. And then it makes some interpolation to figure out where it is. And this is really good, is the classic KNN system. It has some problems. It's extremely bad at, uh, to use for estimating the error of the location. So we use a slightly different variation of this called FLIP. We will, pre uh, we will uh, actually show a paper on this in LBS 2016 in Vienna, which uh, everyone should go to Vienna one time in their life, right? So I will make an ad for this here. Uh, but basically, uh, we, make, we make a super optimized database from the classic radio map fingerprinting map. Uh, and uh, we make it scale invariant, that means that uh, we don't care about the gain settings in the phones that uh, measure the reference map and the current phone. Uh, we, we get around that. Otherwise, you have to start to calibrate uh, your phone to some kind of ideal device and stuff. And we try this, but it scales poorly because, uh, again, the same phone with different firmwares for the radio will have different settings. It's a nightmare to get this working. Uh, some of you have worked with this uh, before, I know. Uh, it's, it's a pretty tricky problem, but if you ignore the total scale, it, it's, uh, you can solve it. Uh, and the other thing we do is we do a rough KNN-like thing to find the right building, the right floor, the right general area, uh, and then we do a fine selection that really improves the position. And that fine selection is what gives us a, a good error estimate as well. So. Uh, so the main thing that you need to make this work is high quality signal reference maps or fingerprint maps. So this is a building with some random fingerprint points I drew, and then I stopped drawing when I got tired of drawing dots. Uh, and this is actually a typical density that you need. So you need around, to get this two to five meter accuracy, you need around uh, one and a half meters to three meters between the points, depending on the building. You need uh, around 60 seconds of measurement per point. But that, that actually includes starting a measurement and ending in a measurement. So maybe you need, you know, you need five, six scans to be really certain. So with Wi-Fi, it's longer. With Bluetooth, it's a bit shorter. Uh, this data, and now it depends a lot on the building. But radios are radios. If you put up a whiteboard, which is made of metal, it changes the radio environment. If you put up a, 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 a new door or a window, it also changes the environment. If you use these cheap beacons that just fit with a sticker, people steal them. So this, uh, we didn't expect this, but I mean, they look kind of cute. People don't know what they are, so they just take them and look at them. Sometimes they put them back in a different place. This is, of course, a nightmare when you have sat down, you planned where to put everything, right? So, so we have huge problems with the map slowly degrading over time. Uh, and. Uh, it takes really a long time to measure this manually. So for this high point market example with 13 floors and uh, many, many thousands of points, it takes weeks to measure these. So one of our first priorities when we got the localization more or less stable was to figure out, can we fix this problem that it takes so long? And the second problem then six months later, you don't want to repeat the, uh, you know, sending interns to a building for two weeks to measure again, right? Uh, 
So, so uh, to do partial updates, so let's say you want to fix just this area, you need to go to exactly the same points again, which uh, turns out to also be a problem uh, because people don't remember where they went and they, or they even enter the wrong points when they manually enter things. So we want to take care of that too. And for this purpose, we use SLAM. And uh, this is a measurement of, uh, I think, uh, Boshian walking through our building. And uh, here is uh, the networks you see, and this is the time, and this is around two minutes, and this is the RSSI you see. So you can see just by walking, you get a really rich picture of what is going on. And uh, with our SLAM system, then we want to use this to create this uh, more structured thing, because this basically uh, on its own is not very useful. Right? So it's just turn the radio scene along the walk path into an accurate radio map. And when you look at these problem statements, that's not the same problem as SLAM usually solves, right? Simultaneous mapping and localization usually find some key points, uh, so some landmarks. Uh, this is not really exactly what we're doing. Uh, but uh, we still call it SLAM because it's very much inspired by th that technology. So I'll give you a walkthrough on how we, we, uh, we SLAM. So, where we make a very simplified uh, on-site survey where we record uh, trajectories. So rather than point measurements, manual point measurements every one and a half meters, you walk around instead. Uh, and then we feed many of these trajectories into our SLAM engine. Uh, we create these uh, radio maps and we send the radio maps to these nice girls who are using uh, our apps. Yep. Uh, so how, how does this uh, survey actually work? Well, really, you just walk a path and you measure the data while you're walking. And uh, either you use the localization engine that you already have in place uh, to get the locations and you use the PDR, or if there is no uh, pre-existing radio map, if there's no localization, you put in a few ground roofs here and there and you use them in place of a localization system. And this, this, uh, just this difference from stopping and just walking is uh, reducing the time it takes to map a big building by 10 times. It's, a, it's an extremely big difference. Uh, once we have uh, this uh, uh, path, we, we actually uh, improve it using the SLAM algorithm. And this is using a graph model uh, SLAM approach, and you can talk to me and Boshian later if you want to know more about it. Uh, why it's much better than uh, just using a Kalman filter to improve the path is that it's a global optimization. It's not just looking at the data that you had uh, a second ago and trying to figure out where you are now, but it looks over the whole path. This, of course, you can't do when you're online. Uh, uh, so, so this is a, a thing that has to run, run offline. So, this part is uh, already in the cloud. Um, the data we upload from these paths is radio data, steps, and locations. And this is a very compressed data format compared to sending like all the sensor data up and stuff, which is also one of the reasons why this uh, works well. Uh, once we have an improved path, uh, we use a, a localized uh, Gaussian process of interpolation, and this moves the uh, observed radio data out to a fixed, regular, predictable hexagonal grid. And this is really a major feature. Now we know where the fingerprint points are always. And if someone else walks a similar path, the same points will get updated with more information. <clears throat> and again, here it's really important to take care if you have multiple device kinds so that the data can be fused together in a predictable way. This is another trick you have to solve to get this working. Uh, this, this takes a little time to calculate. So to speed this up, we, we looked into big data processing uh, where, where they use Spark to do this in memory and efficiently. And actually recordings are already trivially parallel. If two guys are working, the data doesn't have anything to do with each other, so, so that's already easy. We slice this up into useful chunks in our slicer, and actually, again, all the slices are trivially parallel. We can slam the slices individually. Then the interpolation is actually, you make one radio map per beacon. So actually, you can split it up per beacon again, and then you can uh, reduce it back to the, the uh, slam map. 
Um, so, so this uh, gives us the possibility to fully use a computer with uh, many CPUs and seamlessly uh, with Spark, we can also run on hundreds of servers and uh, uh, for example, Amazon Web Services. Uh, so, so we can run this really fast. We can run this much faster than real time, which is really important for us. Uh, so uh, we call this first release the SLAM engine. Uh, so we have used this successfully in many projects. It uh, reduced the time it takes to SLAM by 10 times. It's much less uh, sensitive to noise and bad input than other uh, uh, manual entry because manually entry, the user's big fat fingers has to find the fingerprint points on the map and that actually has a three, four meter accuracy error built in, uh, which is a really big problem. But these trajectories uh, give so much more information, so, so, so that works much better. Uh, it, this actually works not only with radio, but any signal strength uh, or any distance measure. So this is a nice feature that we use later on. Uh, it is super CPU intensive, but parallelizable. Uh, one problem is, uh, that humans are not robots. Uh, that means that they don't come back to where they were in a predictable way. And we kind of wanted this to happen because then you can use loop closure and you can really, uh, when you know that you have been in the same place, you can really constrain everything uh, in the graph much better. Uh, so th this means that we rely a little bit more on ground truth entry than we want to in this uh, first SLAM engine. SLAM engine was released in the public uh, in January this year. Uh, the interpolation grid is really a great invention because it gives us a consistent fingerprint point density. And this actually means that uh, we, uh, we know where, where the fingerprint points are uh, before they happen, uh, which really helps the algorithms as well. Uh, so while, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, okay, just got lost in my slides. Yeah, so while navigating now, we upload all the trajectories and we feed this into an analytic system. And I will show very little about what we can do with this. So we collect always pseudonymous crowd data. Uh, we did this because our customers want to do some analytics. So we collect position steps, context, if uh, people are walking or stopping, uh, radio data and some meta information as well. So you can, in your app, you can send other information, like if you tweet or take a picture, you can actually put that in. Uh, and we can refine the data, so we can improve trajectories in the cloud. Uh, we can estimate things like beacon positions. Uh, we can find dwell time points where people stop. We can find where tra uh, trajectories are clustering. This is uh, San Francisco airport, and this is where people spend a lot of time. So uh, they obviously walk fast through the corridor, but uh, stop a lot here in the... I think this is the baggage area. Uh, uh, we made this as an interactive tool where you can change times uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, so so it's, it's really uh, uh, interactive visual analytics. But uh, then we figured out that some people want to do their own analytics, right? So they want to extract the data. So we have an interface to, to, so you can combine two external data sets and so on. And this is another uh, example of analytics we do. So we cluster paths and we make this uh, transition matrix uh, automatically and this is uh, data from MUMOC uh, and in principle you can see which way people are going through the exhibits this way. Uh, this is just a random example I took so. <laughs> uh, and you can also see this in, over many floors and so forth. It's, it's, it's uh, of course super fancy and also uh, kind of alpha status and crashes all the time but don't tell anyone. Uh, <coughs> so. Now we have a SLAM system that is pretty good already. We collect data from the crowd already for analytics. And then we realized we could probably do a lot more with this than we are doing. And this we call crowd learning. So let's take data from the crowd. So the good news is that users generate a lot of data for free. Storing it is not free, but the data comes for free, right? This is really good. And we already has the, have this pseudonymous uh, uh, foraging in place. So we can just hook into that. Uh, one problem is, of course, you can't really trust people uh, so much, right? 
So individuals, you know, there can be something wrong, maybe their phone is wonky or whatever. But if you have a lot of data, it's much harder, much harder to fool us. So the crowd really gives more power to this. Um, uh, and we compensate for the low quality then by using a lot of data. Uh, and we approach this problem as big data. Currently, I would call this medium data, but uh, it, it is big data once we scale more. And we do this in an incremental approach. That means we continuously try to improve the maps, and then we measure the quality of the improvement, and if it's good enough, we release a map update. So you will get more than every six months, but you won't get the map update every five minutes or something. And this can be throttled up and down, uh, so, so you don't get a redundant amount of information. Right? People don't put up whiteboards all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing is that the, the uploaded trajectories from the phones are not optimized. They are these Kalman filters. And uh, by instead looking at the path that is the output for SLAM, uh, we get these globally optimized things. And that means much higher quality analytics. So humans care about one, two meter accuracy, right? Uh, or up to five meters is fine in a room. But for doing uh, detailed analytics, you really want one meter or better. You want somehow, if you have a shop, you want to know which shelf they're at. You don't want to know, uh, you know if they're in the dairy products. You know, want to know which cheese was so interesting that they stopped there. So the slam paths actually improve things uh, for analytics as well. So. As opposed to the previous picture of, of how this could work, uh, where we had a, a survey team, now it's the users that do the recordings. SLAM is pretty much the same. We create buildings and we continuously ship now radio map updates. Uh, so the next time the same person walks there, the navigation experience is better. And uh, to really put this in some kind of diagram, first we do an initial map, like the good old SLAM with dedicated recordings. So we have a seed map to work with. And then we uh, update it with new recordings from uh, customers, and then we update it again, and so on. Uh, so incremental updates is really how we see this uh, working well. Um, <clears throat> so we tested this in a bunch of scenarios, and here is one case uh, uh, where uh, in this uh, corner office here there were no beacons placed. This is actually uh, 20 meters. Uh, and. Uh, we placed some new beacons to replace the missing ones, and we recovered things with around 30 minutes of, of uh, uh, real-time data. Uh, this is, of course, just an initial test, and we understood that we can do a lot more uh, uh, with, with the, this data. And one thing is that our SLAM algorithm just looks at one trajectory at a time, uh, and the problem of loop closure is still there then. It, uh, so if you want to... Take this to a, a, at a higher level. Um, what you can do is you can use the fact that if you have many trajectories, uh, if you have some guy walking like this maybe, uh, sorry, I don't have a good picture for that. Uh, you can uh, combine multiple segments together and form loops. So you can make the crowd look like a robot that walks in a predictable way by finding points where uh, trajectories overlap. And uh, by combining these multiple trajectories to loops, we can really leverage uh, SLAM to really improve the stuff. Uh, the other uh, problem you have is that there is noise in the locator. There's noise from the location calculations. There's lots of noise in the pedestrian dead reckoning systems. Uh, so, so you will have uh, magnetic anomalies and stuff that, that is, uh, sets uh, the direction off. Uh, you will have uh, missed steps. Uh, and uh, if you have short persons, you might have very many missteps. Uh, uh, or if you have someone that really figures out how to shake the phone in a bad way, uh, you can also get uh, funny data. Uh, uh, but we managed to regularize the paths and straighten them out so they make more sense. So really understanding the trajectories is a key feature in using this crowd data. Uh, then you can actually take a, a set of recordings and uh, you uh, produce a new radio map, and then you rerun the localization iteratively and reinforce the map. So we actually use reinforcement learning to do this, and this really gives much higher uh, output, uh, quality output. 
but it also increases the amount of data processing we have to do. Uh, with this higher quality output, we can actually grow maps from very rough seeds. Uh, so, so one way to do it is, uh, if you want to map this uh, beautiful university, uh, you start with a really good radio map, but maybe just in the entrance. And then you let people walk, and in the beginning it will be quite terrible, but after a while the map can grow, and then we can map uh, everywhere. There is another way to do this, uh, which we are really actively working on right now, and that is uh, the other problem that I didn't talk about, and that is how do you design this uh, IoT-style infrastructure with beacons? Uh, well, you have to put the beacons in good positions for working with indoors location. This is not easy, so we, we re usually rely on some rules of thumb, but this is uh, not so good, right? So. What we're trying to do is we're trying to model the building using a super high quality ray tracer from uh, Austrian Institute of Technology. And together we are making a system that uh, actually predicts how the map should look like. And then we can run our locator on this map and really see how, we, how it should work with these beacon settings. And then we get a map and it's not a real map. It's, it's a map for this theoretical device. It's good enough to get kind of good accuracy in the house, and then we use the crowd to make the map real, to really anchor it in real data. And uh, we think that is uh, one of the uh, major awesome things we can do with crowd learning so far. We're still really exploring this, so, so there's a lot more to learn here. Um, so our, our kind of progression that we did was we started doing manual fingerprinting where you go to a point, you stop for 30 seconds to a minute, and you repeat this like a thousand times in a building. This is super annoying uh, to any one of my interns who has done this a lot. Uh, uh, for me, it's okay, actually, but because <laughs> I don't do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, from January, uh, our customers is using the SLAM engine, where, where you basically uh, either predefine the path or you walk the path and put in ground roofs here and there. Uh, and then uh, you repeat this much less. Uh, so so uh, this means that uh, with a few paths you can get a decent uh, starting map. And uh, our latest status is, is around here, where Slam Crowd is actually working and can update maps. We're still triggering this uh, manually, so we're saying, okay, now it's probably time to improve the map quality, or the customer says, uh, why can't I find the toilets anymore, and then we fix it. Uh, this really has to be automatic for scaling. And really the, the name of the game here is not to have a couple of hundred deployed buildings, but we really want to have all the buildings and the whole world, right? Uh, so, so to do that, everything has to be automatic. And that's why instead of using, uh, uh, instead of relying on this uh, pro, uh, process with uh, dedicated measurements. We're really working on using the crowd data to completely em eliminate that. Uh, so it allows you to actually create maps. And this is really where we're heading in 2017. And that's why the talk is called Crowd is the Future. Uh, for us, it's really literally true. Uh, so I will, give, uh, I will give some summary and conclusions, and then I will open for some questions. Uh, so our whole business is enabling navigation in mobile apps. Uh, we do some other stuff, but really that's the main thing we do. And the main infrastructure we care about is Bluetooth beacons. Uh, we, are, we are not locked into this technology. Uh, we're really open to try new stuff, but as long as that's what the phones of the crowd is using, that is also what we're using. Uh, we get our locations mainly with step detection and radio location. Uh, and getting this to actually work for, for humans, that is two meter accuracy within two seconds, uh, this took a lot of work and we're, we're pretty happy with the status of this right now. Yeah. Uh, with the SLAM, the deployment and maintenance of this indoors localization system is much, much easier. And really taking crowd data into the equation means uh, much less work for us and for customers, and much less work means it's much easier to actually get deployments active. 
Um, so some conclusions about the various points we do. So the SLAM engine was released. Uh, it really improved the creation of maps by 10 times. It's in active use. SLAM Crowd is uh, just released and it's in initial use. It, it really minimizes the map update effort. So that's really a hundred times speed up compared to really measuring again. It's, it's much easier. Uh, crowd learning is really the first step to proper scalable indoors uh, navigation. Uh, it also means something for analytics. And we really see that big data is of ever increasing importance. So we, we get customers that have other data sets that they want to merge. And we really think that in communicating things like maps and data sets and putting them together, that's really where interesting things can happen in the future. So uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're very happy about uh, the situation now. We think we, we have a, a pretty good uh, understanding of what to do. And uh, we have in the process invented a lot of new problems for us to solve. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to do still. So thanks for listening and uh, any questions are really welcome. So I'm Christos Laudias from Huawei Ireland Research Center. Thank you so much for the presentation. So uh, you talked about uh, using uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, right, for your uh, location engine. Uh, I was wondering what about uh, uh, cell uh, towers, cell network information, especially now that you know, um, small cells are becoming increasingly popular uh, inside buildings, so that's one thing. And what about also uh, magnetic uh, field information? Okay. So what's your view on that from a technology? Okay, so the cell towers are great. They work pretty much like uh, better beacons. However, uh, our friends uh, in Apple don't agree that this is a good thing to do, right? It's like Wi-Fi, so we don't get access. So because of this, we focus on the beacons mainly. But uh, yeah, cell towers is possible to use. But when they are not local, uh, we get location accuracy, uh, you know, not in meters, <laughs> but in many tens of meters. So, so it, can, it can work. Uh, and uh, definitely, if you're doing a hybrid solution with many signals, it's definitely possible to use it, definitely. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not all. You can use FM radio the same way, uh, really effectively. But again, yeah, with smartphones, it's not so easy. Uh, um, as for geomagnetics, we are looking at it right now. We have a master's student working on it. Uh, we already know it's possible to get around 10 meter accuracy with this, with not so much problems on a smartphone in real time. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a jumpy, messy business. We really think it is good, uh, but it's not guaranteed to be without redundancy. So you can be in the same, you can have the same uh, time series in, uh, in uh, different places and so on. So together with beacons, it becomes really interesting. And uh, I mean, we see companies doing very good business with this already. So yeah, this is certainly one technology. I wouldn't say that infrastructure-less localization is, uh, is really that easy to do. Yeah. Hello, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my name is Yuri, I'm from St. Petersburg, Peter the Great University, uh, actually Polytechnic University. Uh, my question is about, we uh, had a very good tutorial yesterday about the uh, ultrasonic uh, positioning. So I suppose the modern phones have the loudspeaker and the special microphone for, how to say, to speak in without, uh, how to say, putting it on their head. Uh, I mean, so I suppose those microphones can sense the ultrasonic, not at the upper level, I mean, 40 kilohertz, but about 20 kilohertz or 25 kilohertz, they should, especially if you make this louder. And the, the bacon is very cheap, I suppose, for the ultrasonic. So have you tried this? And so do you have any experience with that? Thank uh, you. We have not tried this for localizations. I've tried this for other reasons, actually, uh, for uh, personal projects. And uh, yeah, about 20 hertz uh, to half the 44 kilohertz uh, 
uh, so 22, you have a small bandwidth where you can use it on current smartphones. There is no reason why you couldn't have higher sampling rates in the phone more than you usually don't need it. Uh, uh, so in principle, you, you could do be better with that even with the existing microphones. Uh, I say it's, it's certainly possible to do it. Uh, light is another possibility to code things in light. Uh, it's, it's really similar to beacons w when you look at it. So there's no reason not to use it really, uh, but uh, it, it would take significant effort away from what we're really good at. So we are not caring so much about it right now, but it certainly is a very promising uh, thing to look at. Uh. Hi. I'm Manuel from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and I had a question about this map refinement uh, process, uh, the SLAM, uh, where you improve the map over time. Um, uh, I can clearly see how you can improve the map when there are new beacons or missing beacons that you have replaced uh, using the current localization uh, system. But how about this example that you mentioned where you have a new whiteboard that will um, deform the whole response. Yeah, so the idea is that the whiteboard does not distort the steps, right? So, so you will see an inconsistency emerging uh, because of this. And it, it will basically look like people are walking like this, right? Uh, and uh, uh, our regularization just kills that. Uh, so, 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 yeah, that's why it works with this. Yeah. I would say really the trickier part is to grow a map. So if you have made a nice localization system for half this room, then by the nature of selecting points and interpolating, you're, you're really restricted to this area. But again, you can use the trajectories going out and coming back to do this slam closure. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really easy in theory and uh, really hard in practice. That's, this is really the the whole uh, situation with indoors navigation, I think. Yep. Hi, this is Isaac. Isaac John from the Lucent Technology. And thank you for the presentation. I would like to uh, ask a question about the characteristics of the cloud source data that you have. Do you need long user traces for the crowd learning, or do you need the users to host the smartphone at a certain posters to perform the task? Uh, actually, we don't care so much about the posture. Uh, we figured out some time ago how to do a posture invariant uh, PDR. Uh, it, it also works kind of okay with the phone in the pocket, a uh, little bit depending on the steps. Uh, um, um, yeah, so, 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 so that's, that's okay. And uh, how much data you need kind of varies. But typically, these segments do not have to be longer than one or two minutes. And the, the ideal situation is really when you're, you're in the, uh, sorry guys, but if we say this is the good side, then what you really want is trajectories that goes from the good side to the bad side and back. And if you can get those within, uh, within this one, two minute time window, that, that is really what you're looking for. And you don't need many of them to do a small incremental update, right? But it, once you, have, uh, once you have done that, uh, you do another update and it grows. And when you say, okay, now we've covered a bad half and it's a good half, then we will release a new map update. Right. There's, a, there's a guy who's been trying a long time here in the front. Here. <laughs> oh. uh, my name, uh, here. My name so is take uh, this one and then you, you yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> uh, De Marinis from Dune, a small company in Italy. I would m move my question in another realm, which is maybe less technical, more practical, economical. Uh, as far as you, for instance, in your example, you deploy 900 beacons in the environment. You probably have to face the problem of the maintenance of your system. You have mean time between failures yeah. of your beacons. So you have, on a regular basis, you have a certain frequency of failures of your devices. So what is your policy about this? What is the, uh, let's call it the uh, operational expenditure you have to face? Uh, and uh, if you have a specific policy, in my opinion, for instance, it makes no sense to try to substitute one beacon each time, one beacon of, as a failure because it's too costly, but yeah. probably you have a different policy. I would just 
a clarification about uh, yeah. so this. There, the, the, the good thing with the beacons then is that they're cheap, so there is some redundancy. So if a few dies, it doesn't matter at all, and the system doesn't even care. Uh, what we see when we do SLAM updates is that we see a decrease in quality. And when we see a, a significant decrease in uh, quality in an area, we can trigger events to fix that. Uh, uh, so, so that is one way to do it. As for maintenance, uh, yeah, the, they are often battery powered. Sometimes they are uh, installed in, in uh, uh, light fixtures with power. Light fixtures are made of metal, so in general, uh, this is a terrible idea uh, because it gives you, uh, it spreads the field very well. So you get, you, we have examples where we saw all the beacons in every position at maximum signal strength. Uh, so, so there's absolutely no information in the field. Uh, but if you put the antenna out a little bit, it works. Uh, yeah, but that, that's part of educating customers as well. Uh, and uh, being from this, like the software side, uh, we have a lot of terrible experience with this. And now we have, we have our beacon expert that really helps in this. Uh, as for, uh, yeah, so when we see that there's time to add the beacons, we, we do it, right? So in this big uh, trade show market, uh, they actually only use this 13-story uh, building uh, once a year. And uh, we usually then uh, replace uh, the worst beacons uh, every, uh, every time there's a new show. Yeah. But it, it is really from case to case. All right. Okay, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have actually have two questions, and they're very practical. So you say you love eye beacons. Uh, I hate them. So uh, <laughs> at the moment in our building, we have about 2,000 beacons. Ooh. Oh. So uh, how is the maintenance? So who is changing the batteries? That's the first question. So how do you do that? Because uh, if you're running them at full speed and at full signal strength, they're empty in about two, three, four weeks. So it's, that's the first question. The second question is, how long do you take to prepare and to set up your system? Because you thought about 11 floors and you do fingerprinting stuff, and I, I can't imagine this happens in one week. Uh, actually, usually it takes uh, one or two days for a, even a pretty large building. Um, the, the beacon installation process is quite easy for us. We, we actually don't even care where they are. We just stick them up. Uh, and. Uh, they are pretty cheap, our beacons. I mean, when you buy a thousand, it's, it's still not cheap, but it is, I mean, it's much cheaper than, for example, Cisco routers or something that you would put in a similar environment. Um, and yeah, it, it is, a, uh, I would say, uh, we never put up beacons that last for four weeks. Uh, uh, this, this doesn't make sense. So, so we reduce the announcement interval uh, suitably. Really, you don't need to see that many. You want to see five to 10 beacons, right? You don't want to see 80 or 200 beacons. That actually gets problems with collisions and stuff as well. Uh, so so you, don't, you want a decent density, not too much. And you certainly don't want to change them uh, more than every second year or so. So, so uh, we have big batteries, though. We have a couple of big batteries in. And that's, the battery is way more expensive than the actual beacon. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it's really tempting to go with powered beacons, but then the installation is much more technical, uh, uh, and this is actually more expensive than the batteries, so it's, it's always a case-to-case -case thing. And uh, that is, I think, a limiting factor for, for how this market grows, is really that uh, we don't really see a silver bullet. We really have to help people still. And when you're 20 people in the company, that's a lot of work. That, that is true. But I, I, yeah, not every four weeks. That's a, that's a, I can see why you would hate them after, <laughs> even after four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nader Moyeri, uh, NIST, USA. Did you ever consider using passive RFID? I mean, instead of, if you use passive RFID along the same questions, you don't need a battery. Of course, there's the issue of having a uh, RFID reader in your uh, phones, and that might be a good uh, trade-off to consider because you're localizing a number of uh, people, and the spaces are typically a smaller number of people as opposed to spaces are larger. 
And then in terms of mapping, did you ever look at uh, uh, using uh, ray tracing? Because you could also use so ray tracing, and would be what would be the quality of maps that you would get that way as opposed to this uh, card source base? So actually, um, um, did I write this? Actually, uh, what I mean uh, with modeling is exactly ray tracing right now. So we are doing it. Uh, but then it's a huge problem to get a good enough building uh, and also to uh, figure out the parameters. So we, we will definitely talk about this maybe next IPIN. Uh, I can't say so much about that. RFID, yeah, we had curious about it. We're interested in it. We don't think that it will work for the scenario when anyone who comes in who has a smartphone can just use localization. We don't think it will work like that right now. Uh, so so uh, at least that's my feeling. So, so we are not uh, really looking into it, but uh, Maybe we will uh, soon, actually. I had an, a guy write me an email this morning about it, so it's not unheard of, yeah, to put it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Firas uh, from Sensware, um, UK. Uh, you mentioned about using SLAM uh, to extend the trajectory, but actually you, uh, you wanted a beacons in order to extend the trajectory itself. So if we don't have a beacon in the other half, it won't be able Then it gets harder, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I was, of course, assuming that someone secretly put up some beacons. Yeah. But yeah, you, so and you can, imagine, uh, you can imagine that you have an airport, and you equip one terminal, and then you equip the other terminal, but you don't do any measurements. It just grows in there somehow. But, uh, uh, or you can imagine also that you start with just mapping one room and then just letting it grow where people go. Uh, but yeah, it does have a, a, a thing about there should be beacons around. Yes, well, so I mean, it, it, I would say the, the more common use case would then be to rely on Wi Fi. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you, you came across that the beacons uh, need to be set up by your team or uh, at least by the client and uh, been informed about it? Or can you use a beacon that's th set up by the third party? Actually, uh, if. If we deem them predictable, we can steal any beacons that are available. Uh, but there are some tricky operators out there who, who uh, encrypt data. Uh, so you have to stay away from those. It's the same with Wi-Fi access point. We had lots of problems with uh, uh, obfuscated uh, BSS IDs and so on. Uh, uh, and this, this confuses the localization process enormously, right? The, 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 it hops around the, the locations. Uh, so, so, so if you find reliable beacons, you can just use them. Yeah. And magnetics is one of the features that really helps this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your presentation and for coming here. And thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. I just would like to give you a small detail Ooh. the part of the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting thank me you for and thanks team. everyone for listening. And uh, I think it's time for a coffee. <laughs> so yes, please.